Good evening. Good evening and welcome to this open event uh, run by Dance Arts Foundation's Organising for Change series. Um, tonight we're going to be using the closed captioning um, feature which is generated automatically so we apologize in advance if there's any problems um, with spelling um, it's uh, because of the technology so a little bit about the organizing for change series that dance art foundation is running it's a series of online events they're free um, they um, comprise of open events like this one and workshops and through these events, the organization is going to be exploring knowledge, resources, histories of people powered community organizing for social change. And it's going to be centering on the lived experience of the speakers. So the speakers will be talking about how they have um, contributed to social change from their own experience. So it's um, very much live and, um, you know, not theoretical, it's really based on what people have um, experienced. So this will be shared with um, attendees like yourselves across workshops, through conversations and open, open lectures. And critical issues will be unpacked that with the hope of um, sharing ideas that can motivate you and give you ideas and tools on making social change yourself and um, organizing and advocacy. Um, myself, my name is Fumi Adewole and I'm an artist and a researcher. I'm a senior lecturer in dance at De Montfort University and I'm a member of the Dance Art Arts Foundation's Artist Council. So tonight is my great pleasure to introduce to you um, Charlotte Bench who will be giving this evening's lecture. But before we go to Charlotte, there's some technical things um, I'd like to put across. Uh, if you're using the Zoom feature and you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any technical problems, please use the chat. Um, there's a technical team which will try and help solve those problems. So our speaker, Char Charlotte Bench, she's an industrial officer with Equ Equity, which is the industry trade union. And Charlotte is responsible for commercial and subsidized theatre directors and designers at this organization. And she also supports um, young members and independent dancers through her role as secretary of the Equity Dance Committee. So Charlotte first joined a union and won her first dispute at the tender age of 19. And she's been involved in such activity since then. Um, she, she, as a union rep, she um, confronted her organization for penalizing staff for having too many toilet breaks and um, she won the dispute. And since then, she has been involved in other things. Um, she, um, she was part of organizing um, a strike against TGI Friday, which was the first kind of strike against that kind of organization in decades. And she's also been involved in as a hospitality rep for Unite. So she has worked in the hospitality sec sector, um, supporting workers. And she, and I think this is very important, she helped the union shape their response to the Me, the Me Too campaign. So Charlotte's lecture will run up until seven o'clock, so for about an hour. And at about seven o'clock, um, we'll take questions. So if you have questions, don't forget to put them in the Q&A feature. So I've done my bit and now I want to hand you over to Charlotte. Charlotte, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Thanks, Funmi. Um, much appreciated. And thanks everybody for, for joining tonight, whether through the Zoom or on, on the live stream. So <clears throat> tonight I want to try and do five things um, in the hour or so I've got. And in no particular order, I want to go over some examples of the basic principles behind successful organising campaigns, along with some of the questions that all organisers should ask of themselves and the organising campaigns they're involved in. I want to talk about developing a theory of change, what that means, why it's important, which will also include looking and thinking about strategy and tactics. I want to go over what organising actually is 
and as importantly what organizing isn't and when something else is happening instead i'm going to talk about power what it is where it comes from how it's built and how it's taken away um and i want to also finally break down some of the false distinctions between different kinds of organizing whether that's community organizing trade union organizing and so on but before i go any further i want to acknowledge that much of what i'm about to say are not my own ideas and I think this is really important because I've been to far too many meetings and workshops about organising where the things that I'm about to talk about are presented as some sort of arcane mystical knowledge a person has to be particularly skilled or intelligent to understand, which is nonsense and only serves to erase the contributions that those organisers who are often black and global majority people came before us. It erases the contributions they've made and it also presents organising as this kind of mysterious secret skill when it is in fact something that anybody can learn to do and do well and actually a key responsibility of people who call themselves organizers and who are interested in organizing is passing on their own knowledge and experiences and creating a whole new wave of people engaged in organizing whether that's in communities or trade unions or anywhere else um, there are some amazing examples of this kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning um, some of which i'm going to talk about a bit later on and I think there is a tendency amongst organisers and people involved in campaigns to spend far too long fixating on the differences between different types of organising. But for me, whilst it's true that the tactics that a campaign might use and the overall strategy that a campaign has might be different in a trade union context compared to a community context, context organising to me is the process of building power and strengthening our influence. And that's true wherever the organizing is taking place. Precisely what you're building power and influence for and what you're trying to achieve will change. But those aims of building power and influence are, are true, irrespective of who or what or where you're organizing. Now, fundamentally, Organising is the process through which we build power and influence and through which we raise expectations. And this is the expectations that we have of each other, of the world, of the local authority trying to sell off council homes, of employers offering bad terms and conditions of employment, of the police and state which criminalise migrants and people who experience racism in our communities. It's our expectations that kids in our communities will have decent childcare provision and our young people will have decent opportunities no matter where they live. Because organising is about showing people that they have a right to dignity at home and at work and that it is not unreasonable to expect better from both. It's about showing people that they deserve pay that they can actually live on in jobs that are not ruinous to their mental or physical health, that their home should be warm and dry, that their communities should be nice places with decent public services and amenities that welcome everybody. But organising is also about relationships. It's about building relationships between ourselves so that we harness our collective power and we're stronger when we, when we stand together. But it's also about disrupting the relationships of the other side, as it were, to take their power away from them and to redress the imbalance of power that often exists between people and the force or organisation or person that they're trying to destabilise through their organising. I'm going to talk more about power later on because this is really important. But first of all, I'm going to go through a list of the key questions you need to ask yourself when you want to win. And I want to acknowledge the work of the Ella Baker School of Organising in providing this framework that I've adapted for my own use. So question number one in your organising is have we got the right target or targets? And in around 350 BC, the Greek philosopher philosopher Aristotle wrote the following. He wrote, it strikes me as particularly relevant today when you look at world politics. It seems to me that the majority of people are angry at the wrong people. They are angry at migrants or people who are poor rather than being angry at the rich and the powerful, the people whose decisions actually impact their lives. And I think that's as true today as it was in 350 BC when Aristotle wrote it. But what that quote points to is that when you are engaged in an organizing project, figuring out what your target is or who your target is is vitally important and when you get it wrong it can result in alienating the people who could actually help you and letting the people who have actually made the decisions or hold the power you're trying to disrupt get away scot-free 
An example of this from an equity perspective is the debates and conversations that lots of us are having about the Arts Council and Arts Councils across the UK nations and the problem of low pay for freelance workers in our sector. And I think it's easy to look at producers as being to blame for this. And in some cases, obviously, they absolutely are. But in others, depressed wages, poor terms and conditions are a consequence of inadequate state funding. If you look around the EU, <coughs> excuse me, the average spend on arts and culture is 0.5% of GDP. Here in the UK, it's 0.3% of GDP. Our sectors are massively, massively underfunded. And whilst we can and should do more, to push the arts councils to offer more and better funding for both companies and for individuals, the responsibility for that, that lack of public money, that lack of resource that's available for culture in this company, in this country, lies firmly with the state. So when we're talking about terms and conditions, it's not just one target. It's not just the producer whose rates of pay we want to push up. It's also the state who plays that key role in enforcing and enabling and facilitating low pay in our sectors. Question two, are we organizing or are we mobilizing? Now, this comes from the work of US organizer and academic Jane McAlevey, who has written a couple of really, really useful books on her experiences of organising and her ideas for how workers can win. And one of her major contributions to, to organising and to providing that framework for organising is drawing out that distinction between organising and mobilising. And that can sound like semantics, but it's actually fundamentally important. Mobilising is gathering and maximising your existing supporters and people who already have some connection with the work that you're doing. So often a minority of people in the affected community that you're trying to win change with. Now, there is a place for this in any organizing campaign, and it can be really important when, for example, the group of people most directly impacted are not particularly powerful or are operating in a very hostile environment. Um, and to give you an example of this, when I worked for Unite the Union, we had a series of actions around Whitbread which is the company that owns the hotel chain Premier Inn. Um, we were organising or seeking to organise around Premier Inn in light of their appalling treatment of the people who worked for them. We called a series of demonstrations outside Premier Inn hotels, and there is no way we'd have avoided workers facing disciplinary action if they had come along to a protest outside their own place of work. So we therefore mobilised other Unite members to join us on these demonstrations which was important because it showed people inside Premier Inn that they weren't on their own. And it also showed Whitbread that the union was paying attention, that we had resources and we had people on our side who weren't as afraid of them as their own workers were. That mobilisation helped build the confidence of the people the campaign was actually about and was actually for and got us in a better place for organising. By contrast, organising is bringing new people into the campaign with you. And the crucial thing here is that organising places the agency for success in the hands of an expanding base of ordinary people. So it's not union staff, it's not highly committed activists who are already involved, it's that expanding pool of people in the community directly affected by what you're trying to change, getting involved and get, shaping the campaign and influencing it and determining its outcomes. The central point is that proper organising understands that it is the community themselves, however that's defined, that is best able to find the solutions to its own problems. Again, at Unite the Union, um, the campaign over tips at TGI Fridays is the best example of organising done properly, because it was TGI Friday workers themselves who talked to other workers about the campaign, who spoke at public meetings and rallies about their fight, who decided what the right actions to take at what time were, and it was the workers themselves who led that campaign. And that's why we ended up seeing the first strike action in a casual dining chain in 30 years. It simply wouldn't have happened without the workers themselves leading that dispute. The final thing that I wanna talk about is advocacy which is done by third party experts on behalf of the people affected. And again, sometimes there is a place for this. So equity, equity does a fair amount of it through the work we do with different government, government departments, for example. So at the start of the pandemic, it was equity and other trade unions that won the self-employed income support scheme through direct advocacy for the workers in our sectors. It was equity in the producers who lobbied for the government backed insurance scheme that's now in place for film and TV. So that if, um, 
film or TV production has to close because of coronavirus. There's government backed insurance underwriting that. Direct lobbying and advocacy are really, really important, but it has to be understood that on their own, they don't build power. They're not organizing. Um, Amy, can we see the slide, please? Thank you. So this chart shows you some of the kind of some of the kind of sticking points, if you like, of different or the or the benchmarks, if you like, of different campaign strategies and different organizing approaches. So whether you're doing advocacy, mobilizing, or organizing. And you will see that when we're looking at advocacy, it's quite elite. Um, it's one-time wins or policy changes through the court or through backroom negotiations. And when you compare that with organizing, it's mass, inclusive and collective. It involves the majority in discovering, discovering their power and potential. Advocacy uses professional lobby groups, solicitors, politicians, um, mobilizing as campaigns run by professional staff. Organizing is where the recruitment and involvement of large numbers of people are all involved and it focuses on creating power. Uh, Amy, can we have the next slide? Thank you. Um, so the third question in any organizing campaign is who are your people? And the woman that you can see on the slide in front of you is a woman called Ella Baker. And she organized with the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People from the late 1930s through to the 50s in the USA. She then went on to work for um, and with Martin Luther King at the Southern Christian Leadership Council. And her first question to any organizer she met was, who are your people? And what that means is, who are you trying to organize? Why? And to what extent is achieving your goal in their interest? In other words, are you organizing the right people that you want to win? The fourth question is, how do we explain who we are and what we are about? And this comes from Marshall Gans. Now, Marshall was an organizer with the Mississippi Freedom Summer in 1964, and he was later the lead organizer for the United Farm Workers in the USA. And Gans talks about three interrelated stories. Uh, Amy, can we have the slide? Thank you. So story number one is the story of self. And that story is what invites people to work with you because they understand your motivation. Now, Gans, Gans states that it isn't enough for me to have sympathy with your ambition. I need to trust you as well. And telling me your story and what motivates you in a way that shows me your values and why you're committed to this thing you're trying to change is one of the ways that you gain my trust and make me more likely to be involved in your organizing works. The story of us is about shared values and shared objectives and the mass majority we need to win our campaign. It asks the questions, how are we going to win this together? And why do all of us matter in this campaign we're doing? The final element here is the story of now. And the story of now communicates the challenges that we face and the choices that we have. It's designed to introduce the sense of urgency and to help you counter responses that you sometimes get in organizing campaigns like, why does it have to be me? I support what you're doing, but I'm, you know, I'm too busy. Other people will be better and so on. And those three stories combined provide that framework for encouraging participation in the work that you're doing in building trust and building relationships with the people that you're working with to mean that successful organizing is more likely to happen. Um, can we have the next slide, Amy? So, the fifth question for organizers is, are we accommodating to reinforcing or dismantling structures of oppression? And this quote is from Angela Davis, and it's one that I keep in the back of my mind when I'm planning an organizing campaign, because you always have to think about how the issue you're fighting or the campaign you want to win impacts on other people according to their race, class, gender identity, disability status, and so on. When this works, it works really, really well. And examples of that are when trade unions, for example, fight cuts to local bus services and they link up with local disability rights campaigns and show an awareness of what a proper accessible bus service looks like for that particular section of our community. When it works badly, 
it looks like the Action Extinction Rebellion took in 2019, when for some reason they decided that the best way to draw attention to the climate emergency was to prevent people from traveling to work on public transport. Um, they put themselves on the tube, at, I think it was Canning Town, um, people who were angry and frustrated that they were no longer able to get to work because the tube system was all gnarled up by this, got really, really angry. Um, and in some cases reacted with violence and aggression towards the Extinction Rebellion protesters. Now, what that action did was it successfully made sure that thousands and thousands of predominantly working class commuters lost sympathy with their aims. Uh, next slide, please, Amy. So the sixth question is, what is the role of solidarity? How will people who are not directly affected be involved and why will they be involved? And the woman you can see on the screen in front of you is Jo Ben Desai. On Friday the 20th of August in 1976, she led a, a walkout of workers at the Grunwick factory in northwest London in protest against their treatment by the management. They joined a trade union, Apex, which was the Association of Professional, Executive, Clerical and Computer Staff, because they wanted to get some help in their campaign for dignity and better treatment at work. And they began to demand that Grunwick should recognise workers' rights to join trade unions. Now, union leaders at the time were all white men, and the strikers did not get the support they deserved from either their own trade union or the TUC, uh, which for those of you who don't know is the umbrella body for trade unions, because of racist attitudes in trade unions at the time that these, women, these were women workers, they were South Asian workers, and therefore what did the union movement have to do with them? But Ben and the women she led refused to accept that. And by 1977, there were huge marches in support of the Grunwick strikers. And on some days, more than 20,000 people were outside the factory in solidarity. And we saw a brilliant example of this solidarity in action last week in Pollock Shields in Glasgow, last Thursday on Eid. Um, at 9.30 last Thursday morning, a van marked immigration enforcement pulled up outside the tenement flats on Kenmuir Street in Pollock Shields, which is one of the most diverse neighbourhoods on the south side of Glasgow. Now, those immigration enforcement officials dragged Sunmit Sedev and Lakhvir Singh from their homes, threw them in the back of the van and presumably were about to take them to one of the um, immigration centres in Scotland. But activists from Glasgow's Unity Centre and the No Evictions Network had been tracking the van and they were able to put out a call for help. Now, can we have the next slide, please? This is one of the, acti one of the activists from the No Evictions Network in Scotland. Um, this man jammed himself under an immigration enforcement van for eight hours hours to prevent it from moving, to prevent it from taking Summit and Latvia to a detention centre. And that bought time for other activists to be able to come down and support the protest and to stop that van from moving. By 5.30pm that night, there'd been thousands upon thousands of Glaswegians on the streets reminding immigration enforcement that those two men were their neighbours and that they were welcome in that community. And by 5.30, Summit and Latvia had been released into the care of Amar Anwar, the human rights lawyer. And now that is a huge, huge victory against the UK's racist immigration enforcement policy. But what's important to understand is that it didn't happen by chance. It is instead the result of organisers within the No Evictions Network and the Unity Centre in Glasgow building a campaign in defence of immigration and people who have migrated to Scotland, irrespective of their immigration status. The numbers of people that we saw surrounding that van were there because of the work that groups like this, that these groups and others like them within the city have done for years, proudly and openly supporting, welcoming and defending refugees and other migrants and helping to win a political argument in the city that nobody is illegal. Now, Sean Bailey, who was one of the activists involved in the No Evictions Network, put it like this. The residents on the street knew what to do and where to call. Subsequently, local activists were able to mobilise quickly and effectively by putting their bodies on the line, buying time for wider mobilisation. Relationships that have been built up through struggle meant that word was able to quickly spread across organisations and networks. People knew what to do, how to act and what to bring. Bus cards, food, water were stockpiled and distributed quickly.
So that protest that we saw on Thursday on Eid looked spontaneous, but behind the scenes that we didn't see was years and years of organizing, relationship building, power sharing, and training and education for activists. Your seventh question for any organizing campaign is, is there a credible strategy to win and at what cost? Now, John Kelly is a UK academic whose research focuses on trade unions, industrial relations and so on. He wrote a book about 20 years ago called Rethinking Industrial Relations, in which he looked at why some workers take strike action and why some don't, even when doing so would be in their best interests. And when the comparison between successful campaigns and unsuccessful campaigns looks quite similar on the surface. Now, John found that the reason that some people don't take strike action or action in defense of their own interests is because of the lack of a credible plan to win. The absence of a vision put forward about how things can be better, what the steps are to get there and why those people have to be involved in it. He said that people undertake their own internal like cost benefit, benefit analysis where in general, if they think the campaign is going to be a lot of effort for little reward and the chances of the, the chances are that they won't win anyway, then they don't bother getting involved. And he identified four key components to a credible plan to win. The first component is a sense of injustice. So people have to believe that they are not just unlucky or misfortunate, but that they have been deliberately wronged, that the thing you're trying to change is a consequence of a decision that was made deliberately and not just unhappy accident. The second thing is tangible attribution. You have to be able to identify the decision makers or people with the power to change what you are campaigning for. If people think that the injustice they are experiencing is simply a consequence of something amorphous like capitalism, then they won't campaign with you because it's hard to organize against an ideology. Far easier and more productive to identify the culpable manifestations of that ideology and hold them to account. So immigration enforcement is a manifestation of the hostile environment and the architect of the hostile environment is the Conservative government, specifically Priti Patel as Home Secretary. Or freelancers did not get sufficient support through the pandemic, and the responsibility for that is the Conservative government, specifically Oliver Dowden as Minister for DCMS and Rishi Sunak as Chancellor. When you give people a visible, identifiable target and cause for the thing that's gone wrong and the injustice that they're experiencing, it's easier for them to see how success might happen. The third thing that you need, according to John Kelly's framework, is a coherent and widespread counter narrative. And this is important because it's how you show people that things can be different. There's a statue to a slave owner in your town that you want to remove. Look at Bristol. Look at how protesters hoiked Colston into the harbour. You've got problems with your landlord. Look at how many evictions tenants union Acorn have prevented. It's about shaping that sense of injustice and showing people this is what's wrong, this is how it could be different. The fourth thing that you require is a clearly articulated strategy. Now, as a teenager, I spent longer than I'm really comfortable admitting involved in campaign groups that didn't really do anything. We met once a week in a community centre, um, we moaned about other people on the left, we went home again and we repeated that same exercise the following week. And with very, very few exceptions, such as teenage me, Nobody wants to be involved in a campaign that has absolutely no chance of success and doesn't do anything. If you want people to act, if you want people to join you in your organising, you have to explain to them why their participation matters and how we are going to win together. You can also think about this in a different way. And this is a framework I got from a, an organiser in the US called Kendra Banks. And Kendra is one of the lead organisers for Hospitality Trade Union Unite here. Um, she's based in New Orleans. Her framework is anger, hope, action. You make the difference. Anger is what motivates people to organise. Their anger at the injustice they perceive is the fuel they need to get them to take action. Hope is important because people have to believe that change is possible. Your job as the organiser or as the person who wants to campaign is to offer a vision of what that hope looks like and of how things can be different by sharing examples from successful campaigns and having a viable plan for action. 
spelling out what we're going to do, how we're going to do it and when. And the final element of her framework, you make the difference. This one matters because why them? Why not other people? Why now? Why do they have to be involved? Next slide, please, Amy. So, excuse me. Um, this is Bob Crow, and Bob Crow was General Secretary of the RMT Trade Union until his untimely death in 2014. And I like this quote a lot because I think it gets to the heart of something important about organising, which is that, yes, we don't always win. But what this misses out is the importance of undertaking a proper analysis so you are prepared for what might happen if you lose. Will defeat mean that the situation is worse than it was before you started? And if so, what steps can you take to ensure people are protected? What are the risks here and how will you minimise them? And again, this matters because very few people want to be a martyr and we shouldn't expect that of them. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of examples, of really, really bad trade union organising campaigns over things like pay and union recognition, where defeat has resulted in a vindictive boss exercising his power over the people who stood up to him and making their lives worse than they were when the campaign began. This can be avoided with proper planning, but the planning has to come first, not mid panic when something is going wrong. Um, next slide, please, Amy. So the ninth question organizers should ask themselves in the campaigns is what is the role of education and training? So in the US in the 1950s, one of the ways the state kept black voters off the electoral register was to utilize a so-called literacy test. If you were black and you couldn't read sections of the US constitution and explain them, then you were disenfranchised and you were not allowed on the electoral register. White people who couldn't read and explain sections of the US constitution were still able to vote. Now, Septima Clark was a public school teacher in the Jim Crow South and using her considerable skills and expertise, expertise as an educator, alongside Ella Baker, who I mentioned earlier, um, Septima set up freedom schools in which adults were taught to read and write by volunteers. The classes were entirely free to attend, but once you had graduated, you were expected to come back and become a teacher for the next class passing on your own education to other people and making sure that the reach of the school multiplied. Now, ultimately, the Freedom Schools trained 10,000 teachers and 700,000 black voters got onto the electoral register after graduating from these schools. Education and training are of fundamental importance in any organising campaign. You need to know your arguments. You need as many people as possible to have the skills required to win. And that means thinking about your skills gaps, both collectively and individually, and thinking about where and how you can access what you need, and then how it can be translated for other people, how it can be passed on. The democratisation of knowledge in organising campaigns is super important. And that's not to say that every person needs to know everything, or that people should be forced into training that they don't want and aren't interested in. But the development of activists is of vital importance in any campaign. What knowledge do you have that you can share? What knowledge do other people have that you'd like to learn? Next slide, please, Amy. So that's um, that's the summary questions. Those are the the ones that we just went through, and I'm aware I spoke a lot, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to repeat them. So question one: Have we got the right target? Question two: Are we organising or mobilising? Question three: Who are your people? Question four. How do we explain who we are and what we are about? Question five, are we accommodating to, reinforcing or dismantling structures of oppression? Six, what is the role of solidarity? People who are not directly affected, putting themselves on the line to help the movement win. Seven, is there a credible strategy to win? And at what cost? Eight, is it better than doing nothing? What happens if we lose? Nine, what is the role of education and training? What do we need? Um, can we lose the, sky, lose the slides for a minute, please, Amy? Thank you. Um, so I'm now, I'm now gonna talk about the theory of change 
And I know that sounds incredibly jargony. So I think the best way for me to sum up what I mean when I say theory of change is what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And how does it help you win? And it matters because too often when faced with some kind of injustice or a thing that they want to change, people will resort to familiar tactics without thinking about which of these tactics, either alone or in combination, will best get them to where they want to be. And it's really easy to set up a change.org petition or to write to your MP. Less easy, but still possible to organise a demonstration at short notice and so on. But all of these things are pointless if, for example, you already know that the person you're trying to convince routinely ignores change.org positions. Or if you're writing to your MP about trans rights and your MP is already on record as being a committed transphobe, it's pretty obvious that an email gets, that gets read by their staffers isn't going to cut it and you'll need to do something else. Or if you want to have a big demonstration, it's pointless calling one if the parliamentary vote on the thing that you're protesting takes place in four hours time. So your theory of change is a strategic process through which you identify a winning approach to achieving positive change and the specific milestones and tactics that are required to achieve that change. And before I go any further, a quick note on the distinction between strategy and tactics. Your strategy is how you're going to get to where you want to be. Your tactics are the tools you use to get there. So that's things like petitions, lobbying MPs or other decision makers, protests, various forms of direct action, public meetings, press coverage and so on. And there are several elements to a good theory of change. The first one is a pathway that illustrates the relationship between a number of short, medium and long term outcomes that are each important steps in achieving your goal. So we're going to do this, which means that this is likely to happen. And we will then do this, which causes that to happen and so on. The second thing is you need a method of measuring progress. So you can see whether or not what you're doing is actually working, preferably using predefined objectives. What was the impact of each of the tactics you chose? And again, it's really important to be honest about this and to be able to acknowledge where things haven't worked. In the example I gave earlier of um, the direct action undertaken by Extinction Rebellion, a sound analysis would conclude that, yes, it raised awareness of their existence and it raised awareness of the climate emergency, but it also irritated thousands of people both within and outside of their own ranks to the extent that they had to issue a statement apologising for it. So ultimately, not that great. The third thing in your theory of change is planned interventions. What are the things you're going to do to navigate the steps that you need to take to achieve your goal? And this could be something like, we want to ensure good press coverage, but none of us in our core group have any media training and we don't have any press contacts. So our planned intervention is that we will approach the person who's just signed up to our campaign asking for more information, who's told us they're a freelance journalist about whether or not she'll help us. The fourth thing is an articulation of the assumptions that underlie your theory. Why do you think what you do? Why have you chosen the pathway and the method that you have? What were your other options and why did you reject them in favour of the ones that you've chosen? What will you do when the situation changes? And it's really vital to get that your theory of change is not some abstract thing that you draw together once and then just shove to one side. It is a vital planning and learning tool and it should be seen as a dynamic document that can be changed and updated as the campaign goes on. And this is because the world around us changes all the time. New opportunities arise as a consequence of the work that we do, but also as a consequence of external factors. And sometimes the opportunities that we thought that we'd have are taken away from us or disappear. And an example of that is this weekend. Over on Saturday, there were, were 150,000 people on the streets of London on the Palestine solidarity demonstration when the organisers of that demonstration had expected 20,000 people tops. So that means the material circumstances in which the campaign exists have altered favourably. And therefore, the theory of change needs to be updated to reflect this new reality. Now, 
the idea of the theory of change originally came out of the charity NGO sector, where organisations were trying to work out why the interventions they were making weren't successful or weren't as effective as they'd hoped. But where trade union and community organisers have altered this approach from the third sector is by introducing a further element to the theory of change, which is the evaluation of why the problem arose and why those with the power to do something about it have not already done so. This means you've got to have an analysis of power and it means you have to understand what power is, how it's built for our side and how it's taken away from those who would oppress us. Um, can we have the next slide, please, Amy? So um, this is Frederick Douglass. He was a national leader of the movement to abolish slavery in the US. And he wrote the narrative of the life of Frederick, Frederick Douglass, an American slave in 1844, as a way to expose the barbarity and cruelty of slavery. Now, we can all recognise power when we see it. We can all recognise it when we see it in action, but defining that power can be difficult. Understanding what kind of power you have or what kind of power you're up against and how it's being deployed against you is really, really important. And there are a few different types of power that I'm going to go through now. The first kind of power is moral power. A moral power is the ability to inflict reputational damage. So, for example, the organising campaign by the IWGB union against Deliveroo. IWGB members have used an array of brilliant, brilliant tactics as part of their overall strategy for workers' rights and recognition at Deliveroo. And they've highlighted the abuse that workers have received from the company, the lack of toilet facilities for Deliveroo riders, the fact that Deliveroo regularly and consistently deny people their statutory rights as workers, and much more besides. And the result of the IWG exercising that moral power was that when Deliveroo announced it was listing on the London Stock Exchange, shares in Deliveroo slumped by 26% on the opening day because investors were nervous about ally allying themselves with a company whose reputation had been dragged through the mud. The second kind of power is institutional power. An institutional power means the legal system, the rules and regulations that protect that protect the powerful. Now, an example of this is in Bristol that I, I mentioned earlier. Protesters successfully tore down the statue of the slave trader in the middle of their city, but the state is preparing to charge them for criminal damage in court. So knowing what recourse to institutional power our opponents have is vital. Understanding how institutional power protects them is important because it helps us to measure the risks of what we're proposing to do. And clearly those risks change depending on the action that you're taking. So you're unlikely to feel the full weight of the law against you with a petition, but you might, if you quite rightly, in my view, start toppling statues of slave traders. The third form of power I wanna talk about is structural power. And structural power is the position, is the power that comes from your position within a system. So an example of this is the RMT trade union. They have a huge amount of structural power because all the RMT need to do to grind London to a halt is call a few hundred tube drivers out on strike. Less positively, Rupert Murdoch has appalling structural power because the companies he owns entirely dominate our media landscape. Positional power is the power that people in leadership positions have. So Boris Johnson has loads of it because he's prime minister. Company CEOs have more of it than their junior staff. Darren Henley as the Arts Council England, um, as the boss of Arts Council England has more of it than his uh, relationship managers and so on. What's important for us is associational power. And associational power is the power that comes from building solidarity with each other through trade unions, through campaign groups and through civil society organisations. And a prime example of this is Black Lives Matter, who raised a staggering million pound, more than a million pound through crowdfunding last summer, and are now using that associational power that that, that, that campaign and that Act, that summer of activity last summer has given them. They are supporting other people with that money. And it's a brilliant, brilliant example of the associational power that our side can have when we stand together. But people who do have power tend to use it over others to accumulate advantage. 
So if you want to change the outcome of a complex system, you need to change the power balance within it. So power within is about supporting people to develop the capacity to act for themselves or by asserting their existing rights and acting upon them to create change. Power with involves people coming together to create their own solutions. And a good example of this is the mutual aid groups we saw at the start of the pandemic to where people came together to support their communities, where local authorities and government had failed to put proper systems in place. Um, in my local mutual aid group, for example, people who were very vulnerable and were told to shield at the start of the pandemic were entirely failed by the local council. Um, and so it was the mutual aid group who stepped up to do people's shopping, collect prescriptions and so on. Power over is the ultimate, ga is the ultimate aim in an organising scenario. Because when you get organised, you take power from where it sat before. So a group of workers organising through their trade union to force concessions from their boss, who is obliged to change his mind on what he wanted to do because the balance of power has moved and those workers now have power over him. That's the ultimate aim. And once you've finished working out what kind of power you have and what kind of power you need to disrupt, you need to analyse it and map it out. One of the best ways I know of doing this comes from the work of Jane McAlevey, who I mentioned earlier. And this, again, this works for whatever kind of organising you're doing. Um, Amy, can we have the slides back, please? Uh, skip that one. Thank you. So this is like I know I'm presenting this to you and it's like a complete chaos map. I should be really, really clear that I didn't draw it myself. Um, but it is once you've kind of you need to sit with it for a bit and look at it and work your way through it and then you can kind of get your head around what it's actually saying um and how it works but i think it's it's incredibly useful and you will see that there are different approaches you can take to this map on the axis you can see that you've got the ability to plot how supportive or hostile the people or organizations you're seeking to move have and what power they've got, with zero being not on the radar and 10 being decisive decision-making power or influence. And this talks you through the steps that you should take when you're building an organising campaign, when you're starting to do your plan. So step one at the top here is sketching out your competing agendas, the agendas of those who are causing or perpetrating the problem and your agenda, the conditions that you want to bring about. So an example of this might be your campaign on the one side, you are, I don't know, you live on a council estate and you want the council to address the mould problem in the home. So you're on one side, the council is on the other. Then you look at step two, and step two tells you to define the systemic problems or conditions which are negatively impacting primary constituencies. So what are the problems? What causes them? What is the impact of those systemic problems on the people affected? We have mould in our homes. It is causing respiratory and other health problems. And we are paying rent somewhere to live. We are paying rent to live somewhere that is slowly killing us. Step three, who are your decision makers? So that would be in this scenario, the council, but specifically who? Who is the housing officer? Who is the person that runs the department? Who is the responsible councillor? What do you know about these people? What influences them? How could you move them through your campaigning activity? And then we have step four, sketch major issue policy battles related to problem conditions that are going on. So that would be, what do you know about the disputes around housing at the moment? What is happening in housing in this country that presents you with the background to the campaign you're trying to win? What things do you need to be aware of that are going on legislatively or what are the council's policy positions and so on? Step five, sketch your major organised opposition. So who are the people that are going to be opposing your campaign and your organising? What are their aims? What are their objectives? Who are they? Where are they? Where do you find them? What interactions have you had with them so far? How do we think we could move them? or at the very worst case scenario, how do we keep them out of the way? Six, sketch organized other, the people around you in your community or within this sphere 
when it's not clear if they're for or against. And there are examples where it can be really useful to think about this in terms of sports clubs, for example. So when we were doing the uh, TGI Fridays campaign, we contacted a, a number of the nearby um, supporters clubs for close football stadiums and we got loads of support off them. We didn't know what their attitude was going to be when we contacted them. But when we did contact them, we found out they were broadly receptive to the idea of supporting the TGI Fridays workers in dispute. And we got a lot of solidarity from them that we wouldn't have had if we hadn't have asked them for it. Seven, potential organised allies. Where, who do you think you're pretty sure that you, you could get on side? What are the tenants associations in the local area that might help you? Are there any renters unions? What about trade unions in the local area? Is there a local trades council? Is there a, um, I can't think of, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but is there like a mother and baby club? Is there any kind of social activity that happens on the estate where you're pretty sure that people would support you? What's their agenda? How do you know them? What are your connections with them? How can you get them to move? Eight, key unorganized social sectors. What else is going on that isn't organised? What else do you need to know? What else is happening on that estate? How are you going to be involved with those people? How are they going to support your campaign? What work are you going to do? And then number nine, analyse the picture, develop strategies for changing the equation. So all of this stuff that you know, all of this activity you've undertaken, what is the picture that it gives you? What does it tell you you need to do? How does it help you pick your strategy? determine your strategy and pick your tactics. What tactics are good for which people? How do they differ depending on where they stand on your chart? What power and influence do they have and who's your priority? Because it's all well and good talking to the very, very supportive mother and baby group, but if they've no power and no ability to do anything about it, you might want to spend more time on the hostile local councillor who might be convinced to persuade you. So this framework, gives you the ability to chart the wider ecology in which your campaign sits and helps you figure out what your priority for action is and how to move through it. Um, and I think that's all from me for now. I hope that's been useful. I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, and I should add that if anybody has questions that we don't get round to tonight, I'm really happy for people to email me or find me on Twitter and so on. But thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. That was riveting. Very, very thought provoking. Um, inspirational. Um, just checking to see if there's any questions in the chat. Okay. You have a, one of the attending attendees, David Warren, is saying fantastic, inspiring presentation. Thank you. Um, that Thank was you. Yes. <laughs> At the moment, at the moment, it doesn't seem like there's any questions. Oh, there is one. Um, we have a question from Karma. And the question is, how would you advise organizing something like BDS? What is BDS, Karma? Can you put a bit more information? So I think, and um, this can be corrected in the chat if I'm wrong, but I think BDS is uh, boycott, divestment and sanctions, which is the movement that has been started by people who are in support of Palestine and organising around Palestinian solidarity, encouraging boycotts, divestment and sanctions on the state of Israel. Now, what I would say about the BDS campaign is that it's not a question of starting the campaign because the campaign already exists. The organising work is being done. So the, the actual question is, how do you get involved with it? And the answer to that is, if you go on the website of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, there are pages and pages and pages of resources on what BDS is, why it's a tactic that's endorsed by Palestinians and why it's a strategy that's endorsed by Palestinians and how you can support it in your day-to-day -day life and the ways that some people have organised for BDS. Um, university workers, for example, have refused to participate in academic conferences that take place in Israel. Um, supermarket 
shoppers and campaign groups have organized to pressurize supermarkets to remove Israeli produce from their shelves. Um, there's all sorts of different ways. Musicians and performers have refused to perform or visit Israel while um, whilst they are still bombing Gaza and the West Bank. So for that campaign, the structure is already in place. It's just about getting involved in it. Thank you very much. We still have, we can still ask questions for the next 15 minutes. So any questions? Yeah. So there's a question here about how about organizing without any money? Um, do you have any suggestions or ideas about how that can be started? It doesn't take money because I think one of the kind of one of the sort of common misconceptions about organizing is that it requires tons and tons and tons of resources. And in some cases, that's true. But the most effective resource for organizing is people. And it's so therefore it's not a question of money. It's a question of time. And I think one of the things that is particularly difficult within um the freelance world and with people who are juggling three or four or five different jobs in any given week is finding the time for organizing and that commitment to the cause is not what's in question money money will be an issue when it comes to lobbying and to campaigns and that kind of thing but it doesn't need to be the thing that holds you back you know social media is free online meeting platforms to get people together and have conversations with them are free and by far the most effective organizing tool that you have is yourself and you can't pay for that because you convince people to get involved not because they've read a promoted tweet on twitter or whatever but because you had the conversation with them everything i've ever done social media and stuff that we've paid for has been a nice addition to the actual organizing campaigns and the organizing work of having those conversations with people one-on-one -on -one about why they have to get involved, why it matters and what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just to add to that, um, Charlotte, um, I know that some people uh, are thinking about raising money to pay a lawyer or an advocate or get specialist information around um, the institutional power. You mentioned institutional power and being able to weigh up what a campaign might bring against you and some of the funds people think of going in that way and it seems you're suggesting through your examples that it might be targeting someone who has that knowledge and bringing them into the campaign to sort of support like you mentioned bringing in a journalist who might help you um, organize the media rather than raising the funds to pay a journalist yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, the, the example that I mentioned of what happened in Glasgow on Thursday is the prime example of that. Amar Anwar, the human rights lawyer, was absolutely central to what happened on Thursday because Amar Anwar used his considerable skills and experience as a human rights lawyer to negotiate with the Home Office and Police Scotland for the release of those men. And therefore those particular skills and experiences that he had are of crucial importance to that campaign. And it's about finding within your own networks and within the networks of the people you're working with, who do we know that has this knowledge? Who do we know that has this expertise? Who can help us and why should they? Um, but those people are out there and should definitely be approached. Okay, thank you very much. Just checking if there's another, any more questions. In the absence of a question in the chat, and I'm, I'd like to encourage people to put, you know, put more questions and let's ask um, Charlotte's stuff while we have her. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask a question. Um, a lot of what you spoke about required peop people to really reflect through their situation and their circumstances. And you used a word at the end, which we use a lot in dance, which is the dance ecology. We talk about dance, for example, being in an ecology of organizations and networks. Um, it sort of uh, struck me that maybe a facilitator that could help people really think through who, who has the power, what's ac the actual problem, who do they need to target? Um, I'm thinking at, at, at a new level, when, when a problem might just started, it, it might not be so obvious to to those who want to 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 organize what the, what those things are where they should um, direct their energy 
is there anywhere one can get a facilitator or actually be to talk them through this kind of thing or how they can develop those kind of facilitation skills? To yeah, your trade union. Yeah, your trade union can give you campaigns training. Your trade union can support you to develop your own campaigns. Your trade union can provide you with resources and connections and networking opportunities and all sorts of things. Thank you. That's interesting. I didn't know that. And I'm a member of a union. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the issues that trade unions have is that and I say this about every trade union, not just the ones that I've worked for or have been a member of, of which there are quite a few. Because trade unions do so much, communicating about it all really well can be difficult. Um, and at Equity, for example, we know that we've got work to do to improve the way we communicate about the work that we do so we've set up a communications working party which is made up of equity members who have basically been tasked to look at everything the union does and tell us why and where it needs to get better um, and that's resulted in some really really interesting conversations about what union communications and campaigns are actually for but this for me is entirely the right approach because you know trade unions are run by their members for their members so their members have to be in charge of what's happening. And that means having oversight over what the union creates and produces and how it talks to people and why and when it talks to people. And I think that we will get a lot better at that because of the oversight that our members will have on, on this kind of work. Yeah, thank you. That, that's enlightening. There's a question here in the chat and um, it, it goes, it seems like a lot of organisations organizing in the arts cannot be well thought through and ends up recreating systemic exclusions, lots of conscious and unconscious bias. Do you recommend specific structures for groups um, in terms of how they meet and work together and, and that can help circumvent that? So how can different, how can groups yeah, so I'm not sure I'd recommend certain structures because I think it's for the people in the group to determine what, stru what structure works best for them. But what I would say is that one of the things that's super important when you're thinking about starting some organising and working on a campaign is looking at who's in the room with you and more crucially, who's not in the room. You know, what, what, what part of our workforce, what part of our society our society is not sitting around the table with you and why aren't they there and what do you need to do to get the voices that you don't have around the table to join you who do you need to reach out to to make that different and then it's for that for that group to determine its own structure on how it operates um, for me the main thing is maximum participation how do you encourage as many people as possible to be involved making sure that your campaign and your organization is fully representative of the society that we live in otherwise you're just replicating those old same old systemic problems that we have in this sector with things like institutional racism with things like incredible bias against working class people with the problems of representation for older women with the problems of access for deaf and disabled performers the problems of representation for trans and gender variant people you know all of our campaigning work has to be properly reflective of everybody that works in this sector because if it's not it's not going to work Okay, thank you. Just checking to see if there's another question. Uh, yes, and Hannah has um, a question. In a practical sense, how do you organize online? What social media networks do you use or avoid? It seems particularly important at the moment, given the ongoing difficulty of meeting in person. Um, I, I don't like social media for organizing. And the reason that I don't like social media for organising is because I think that there is no replacement for a face to face conversation. And obviously that's really hard at the moment, but you can so you can use social media to sort of start those initial conversations. And through the pandemic, I've reached out to people on Twitter. Um, I hate the phrase reached out. I've got in touch with people on Twitter um, or on Instagram or other social media platforms to say, hey, can we have a chat about X, Y, Z? And then as quick as I can, I've turned it into a Zoom meeting. Or if we live near enough by for me to go and see them in a park, then that's what I've done. I think social media can be an incredibly toxic place. And 
I think, and I speak as somebody who's been the victim of some of social media's toxicity, you know, the way that people say things to you and about you that they would never say to your face. I think it creates this really noxious culture that is actually antithetical to organising because organising is about building bonds with between each other and supporting each other and building those connections, not like firing off random insults at four in the morning. So I don't, I don't really like to operate in that space, although I do recognise that it has, it, it has its uses, um, but it has its uses for, for very limited functions. You know, in my job at the moment, I can use my work Twitter account to draw attention to a bad employer. You know, I can draw attention to somebody who's offering um, below national minimum wage for a job and that will get a few likes and, you know, some retweets and equity members going, this is outrageous, but doesn't change anything. What changes something is me getting in touch directly with that producer and talking to them about what they need to do and why they need to do it differently. And the other issue with social media is that there's no enforcement mechanisms behind it. So you look at the kind of yes or no movement that happened last year when people were campaigning to be told if they've got a job or not, doesn't mean anything because people make all this big noise about, oh, yes, this is very important. And then three weeks later, equity members are coming to us, to us and saying, um, so this organisation was on Twitter a month ago telling me how they were going to do the yes or no. And it was really important. And they were quite clearly only doing that for clout because I had an audition two weeks ago and I've just found out through their social media announcement that I didn't get it so I think on social media I think people have to be really cautious and understand its limitations like use it for what it's good for which is finding other people or raising awareness or that kind of thing but in and of itself I don't really think it's a good organizing tool because it doesn't really help you build those connections in any meaningful or sustained way okay thank you um Thanks very much, Charlotte. We've, we're coming to the end of our Q&A session. Um, but before we go, I'm just seeing if I can ask one more question. Um, from your experience working with, with the arts, what would you say is, um, what would you say is one of maybe one of the barriers or one of the challenges, I mean, artists have in sort of organizing to improve um their work um people don't recognize their own power people don't recognize their own power in the arts because people are so isolated from each other because you go from job to job to job so you don't have that time to build up sort of sustained relationships with your colleagues that it takes a while to feel that sense of collective power mm -hmm. yeah i would i would concur thank you so much that 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 was amazing very enlightening um, thank you very much again for this evening. And um, yeah, I will, I will be reading over those slides again. And thank you everyone for attending. And before we go, I would really like to um, say thank you to some of our supporters. We'd like to thank the Arts Council England and also to acknowledge Amara Rahim and Joe Moran, who have curated the Organising for Change series that we're enjoying right now. We'd also like to um, thank some of our colleagues, Rebecca Winston at New Economic Foundation, Aisha Thomas-Smith and Esme Dalgby at, at the New Economic, who are also part of um, the New Economic Organisers, Efrosini Protopapa at Roehampton University, David Branniff Herbert at the National Education Union and Ian Morbud at Equity. Equity, And we thank you all for your input and support. So we'll be, we hope you'll be able to join us for some further events. There's a whole week of them. Please contact uh, the, the organization's website. That's Dance Arts Foundation. Please look in the chat. We've put some links there for you to look at. And um, yes, we hope to see you online again this week. Thank you and bye.